Everyone loves a good story, especially when David Steele tells it. <laughs> From the time we are born to the time we die, our lives are filled with stories. The stories we tell ourselves and each other, and the stories we come to know through things like books, theater, music, and art. These stories help to shape who we are, what we value, and how we come to understand the world around us. The Bible is no exception to this. It's filled with stories about people, politics, moral lessons, and cautionary tales. Ultimately, it's a book about humans trying to make sense of our world and about a God who challenges, loves, guides, and inspires them. This morning's story from the Book of Kings is part of a longer narrative about Elijah's encounters with the people of ancient Israel. Chapter 19 opens with, we heard this morning, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all of the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sends a message to Elijah. So may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Wow, that's an opener that makes you want to know more. <clears throat> Who are these characters and what has Elijah done and why? What's going to happen next? So before we dig into the rest of today's story, I want to give you just a little bit of historical context. According to the Book of Kings, Elijah, which in Hebrew means my God is Yahweh, was a prophet and miracle worker who lived in the northern kingdom of Israel during the reign of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel in the 9th century BCE. Prior to chapter 19 in the Book of Kings, we learn that a turf war has broken out between the Levites, supported by Elijah, who worshipped Yahweh, and the Canaanites, supported by Ahab and Jezebel, who worshipped the deity Baal. Elijah directly confronts his opponents by summoning prophets from each side to a mountain where they put God to the test, so to speak, by preparing two bulls for sacrifice and asking their respective gods to send down fire. Conveniently for Elijah, Baal does not send the fire, but Yahweh does, thus in his mind, proving that the Canaanites are worshiping a false god, and they should be punished. So Elijah then orders his followers to kill the 450 prophets of Baal, which of course enrages Ahab and Jezebel. I want to note that um, I did a lot of reading this week, and this is a gross simplification of what happened prior to this text, so I encourage you to, um, if you're interested, go home and read things. It's really fascinating. <clears throat> so this is where we pick up today's story. Elijah is afraid for his life and flees to Beersheba in the southern kingdom called Judah, which is significant because it's out of the reach of the king and queen's jurisdiction. From there, he heads on a journey into the wilderness and finds solace and sleep under a broom tree. If you're wondering what a broom tree is, I had to look this up. Imagine like an overgrown forsythia. It's a tall tree with yellow flowering um, buds on it. So hungry, exhausted, fearful, and full of self-doubt, Elijah wonders if he can go on and even considers ending his life, saying, it is enough. I am no better than my ancestors. I wonder if Elijah might have also been feeling any remorse for the lives that were just shattered by the violence that he ordered. But that's a sermon for another time. And I also wonder how this story might be different if told from the perspective of Ahab and Jezebel, similar to how the story of the Wizard of Oz looks different when told from the perspective of the bad witch in Wicked. This also could be a totally separate sermon. But one thing is for sure about the story that we heard today.
In it, we are getting a glimpse of the private, struggling human side of Elijah, which is in stark contrast to the very public, powerful, and prophetic side of the earlier chapters. It is here in this moment of internal turmoil that God sends an angel to attend to Elijah who encourages him to eat and drink because, quote, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. This nourishment enables Elijah to travel on to the Mount of Hora, which is also Mount Sinai, where Moses had received the Ten Commandments. It's here that he hears the voice of God asking him, what are you doing here? After Elijah pleads his case, he ins he's instructed to stand on the mountain and wait for the Lord who's about to pass by. After a series of extreme weather events, a great wind, an earthquake, and a fire in which God's voice is not found, along comes the sound of sheer silence. In some translations, it says a gentle whisper, or in others, a still, small. It's here that Elijah finally hears the voice of God, inquiring about his reasons for being there and redirecting the conversation by telling Elijah to go forth on his journey, returning to the northern city of Damascus so that he might anoint new leaders and ultimately his successor, Elisha. What are we to make of this story? We could speculate more about Elijah's motives, his theology, his personal agenda. But what I find most powerful about this passage is about how God comes to Elijah in his deepest and most vulnerable time of need to provide sustenance and encouragement for his journey. One might expect the mighty and powerful God to show up in some spectacular way, in the wind, earthquake, fire. But no, it's not until all of these distractions subside that Elijah is finally able to free, to feel, sorry, the abiding presence of God. It's not until all the distractions subside that Elijah is finally able to feel the abiding presence of God. Isn't this sometimes true for us too? We end up looking for God in all the wrong places. Or sometimes we're so distracted by the noises in our own heads that we fail to sense the spirit who may be wanting to tell us something. We too find ourselves hungry, exhausted, and full of self-doubt, longing for God to renew and redirect our lives. The stories we sometimes tell ourselves about our own worth and our own capabilities are shattered by the voice of God saying, you are made in my image and you can do this. I wonder about these kinds of stories in the Bible, ones where God provides strength, courage, comfort, and direction. I wonder how they have shaped and influenced people over the course of history particularly on this day when we as a nation are celebrating Juneteenth, I think about how the Bible stories of liberation, justice, and God's unconditional love for all people worked to bring peace and purpose to enslaved people who were finally set free from their bondage. Even when this very same Bible was used by other humans, as a weapon to justify their enslavement. I wonder why it took almost two and a half years for the news to travel to Texas and other parts of the South, given that the Emancipation Proclamation happened in January of 1863. Sometimes we resist telling the stories that don't serve our desires for privilege and power. I also wonder why the story of Juneteenth is something that many people, including myself, 
only really started to learn about in recent years. Interesting how some stories, even really, really significant ones like this one, have been left out of our history books and our shared conversations. Sometimes the stories that we don't tell are more revealing than the ones we do. But the truth is that the story of Juneteenth, which is also called Freedom Day or Emancipation Day, has been told and retold by many African Americans ever since that day, on June 19, 1865, when 250,000 enslaved people in Galveston, Texas, finally learned of their freedom. Pulitzer Prize winning his, uh, historian and legal scholar, Annette Gordon-Reed, grew up in Texas, and both sides of her family lived there since the early to mid 1800s. In 2021, she wrote a historical memoir titled On Juneteenth, On Juneteenth, which is about her life growing up in Texas in the 60s and 70s, and about the significance of celebrating the holiday with her extended family and friends. Although Juneteenth, although Juneteenth didn't become officially recognized by Texas until 1980, Gordon Reed notes that it had been informally recognized and celebrated by African American communities across the country for over 150 years. Sometimes silence is really important. It helps us to clear our heads, filter out unnecessary noise, and perhaps if we're lucky, even hear the voice of the one who whispers words of comfort confrontation and direction. And other times, silence is a curse. When we choose not to speak up against oppression and injustice, or when we silence important stories that need to be shared. I thank God for the people who are brave enough to tell their stories, and for those who listen with open hearts so that we might widen our understanding of what has been and look with conviction and hope towards what could be. We need each other for this, and we need God, who walks with us on this journey 